But there's one they fear. In their tongue, he's Dovahkiin, Dragonborn. Greetings everyone, my name is Proto and welcome to another episode in getting into PC gaming. It really does feel great to be back, half a year of absence, and you guys have been extremely supportive throughout. Now I have finished my level so there shouldn't be any repeat of this, at least not until next year, but regardless of that, today I'll be going over a question I think many people still don't actually understand. Or at least, they don't know how to answer it. I am of course talking about in-game settings, more specifically, what each graphical setting does. Now before I actually break down each of these graphical settings, there is one thing I still need to explain and that's the relationship between graphical fidelity and frame rate. Now frame rate is just frames per second and quite self-explanatory. It's the number of images or frames portrayed on your screen in a single second. The higher the FPS, the smoother the game runs and feels. Now you should know that this isn't actually a setting though. There are many things that affect your FPS, but a good rule of thumb is that the more demanding settings take the graphics card longer to render each frame and therefore your FPS goes down. If it's too high, you may feel that it's a lot more fluid, but due to other limitations such as the screen you're using, you may not actually be able to take advantage of it. If it's too low though, that's much worse. You'll get horrific tearing where the lower part and upper part of your screen aren't in sync and your gameplay experience will be a slideshow. Higher frame rates and displays are objectively better. Just know that you could be pushing 400 FPS, but your screen may only output 60 due to its refresh rate. You can buy monitors with a refresh rate of 120, 144, 165, and even 240 hertz, allowing the monitor to update much quicker and display more images per second. Also, as someone who uses both a 165 hertz monitor and a 60 hertz monitor, the difference is night and day. If I were you though, I'd aim to reach a frame rate just above the refresh rate of a monitor. That's a story for another time though. Now the too long didn't listen is that intensive settings reduce your FPS in the vast majority of cases and so whilst your image may look nicer, the experience may overall be hindered because of this too low FPS. As for the actual settings, now the first setting you're often met with is resolution. Resolution is just how many pixels are present on the screen. If you're not familiar with this, you've probably heard of terms thrown around such as 1080p, 720p, 900p, 4k, 1440p, etc. Most monitors and TVs have an aspect ratio of 16 by 9. That means for every 16 horizontal pixels, 9 are vertical. It's just a ratio. And that's how you get 1920 by 1080 for 1080p, 3840 by 2160 for 4K, 1280 by 720 for 720p, and I think you get the gist of it. These numbers represent pixels, which are essentially just really tiny squares. So 1080p will have 1920 pixels horizontal, by 1080 pixels vertical. Older monitors may have a lower resolution and have different aspect ratios such as 4x3, whereas new monitors may have a 21x9 aspect ratio, which is considered ultra wide. Now this does of course change the amount of pixels. High resolutions in the image look a lot sharper because this increase in pixels can better define the image. That said, it's based that this setting is left to your native resolution of your monitor or TV. Now, what does this actually mean? Well, if your monitor is a 1080p monitor, you should try and leave it at 1080p. You can go lower to say 720p on a 1080p monitor to get better FPS, this is called downscaling, but you should just know the image will look a lot worse. Another thing to consider with resolution is the size of your monitor. Now, I'll give you an example. A 27-inch 1080p monitor will look worse than a 17-inch 1080p monitor if you're sitting reasonably close to it. This is because although they have the same number of pixels, the 17 inch monitor has condensed it in a much smaller space. This is called pixel density. And it means that you'll find a higher pixel density in a smaller monitor of the same resolution. Now resolution will greatly affect FPS. It's why you might get 140 FPS at 1080p and say only 50 FPS at 4K. Now for each additional pixel, the graphics card has to render another pixel. So when increasing the resolution, the graphics card will take longer to render the entire image just because it's composed of a greater number of pixels. Next we get onto V-Sync or Vertical Sync. Now one of the things many PC gamers have got used to is tearing. Now tearing is a part of the screen is not in line with another part of the screen, as I mentioned earlier when I was talking about frame rate. 
Now this is because your frame rate is out of sync with the refresh rate of your monitor. Because the way each frame is rendered and pushed out to the display, this only occurs horizontally or sideways. And for that, there's a couple of ways to fix it, being G-Sync and FreeSync, which are proper hardware implementations that come with a specific monitor, or the in-game setting being V-Sync. Now, V-Sync caps your frame rate to the closest value. Now, let's say you have a 60Hz monitor and you're outputting, I don't know, 100 FPS. V-Sync will cap your max FPS at 60 because that's as far as the refresh rate of your monitor goes. Now, let's say in another game, you only get 50 FPS. Now, traditionally, you'd get tearing, but with V-Sync enabled, it jumps to the next synchronized value being a 30 FPS cap. And whilst this means that your GPU can push 50 FPS, V-Sync will lower it to 30 until you push above 60 FPS, where it will then cap your frame rate at 60. If your frame rate is all over the place, this can lead to a lot of stuttering though. On top of that, with the way V-Sync works, it adds a fair amount of input lag. This means that you'll feel a small delay between moving the mouse and the character performing an action. As such, it may feel sluggish and slow enough to the point where it's pretty frustrating. This is one of the settings where I adamantly recommend everyone to just keep disabled. It's a useless setting and no one should use it. On the other side of the spectrum, we've got a rather useful setting and that's called anti-aliasing. Now what you've probably noticed at one point or another is where part of the screen doesn't look smooth and a little bit pixelated towards the edges. As we've mentioned, images or frames are composed of these tiny squares called pixels. And this means that when the in-game object or whatever has rounded corners, rather than completely straight lines, the computer has to try and figure out a way to make these pixels a rounded shape. And they do this by going corner to corner rather than side to side. Now you will see this more often with small and curved objects in games, such as a telephone pole line. These are considered the jaggies, just because of the jagged edges that step down like a staircase. Now anti-aliasing tries to smooth that out and make it look a lot nicer and less jagged. That said, if you have a look in the menu, you'll be presented with many different options that all sound the same, but the way they work is a little bit different. Now all of the different types fall under one of two categories being post-processing AA, or Spatial AA. Now, post-processing AA includes FXAA, TXAA, SMAA, MFAA, and MLAA. Jesus Christ. Now, what this does is smooth the edges by summoning the colors beside the rough edges after the frame has been rendered. Spatial AA, which is the other category, includes MSAA, SSAA, FSAA, and works by rendering the image at a higher resolution and then downscaling that to get a similar effect to what bumping up the resolution would do, just not to the same degree and without the massive performance hit, but still a lot more than post-processing normally. Now there's no point going through all of them just because there's too many and quite honestly we'd be here forever, but I'll at least explain the main ones. Now first is MSAA, which stands for Multi-Sampling Anti-Aliasing. MSAA detects the edges of the polygons and only increases the number of samples there. This means that it averages the different colors of the pixel and displays that rather than just ignoring the surrounding pixels and using one sample. It doesn't blur anything and does this immediately, so it will likely hit your system a lot harder than something like FXAA, but it will also look nicer. Now, SSAA is super sampling anti-aliasing, which looks the best, but gives a massive performance hit. It works by increasing the number of samples in each entire image and not just the edges. This means that it gets a lot sharper, but still stays at the same resolution. Now do bear in mind that running something like 1080p at 4 times SSAA would have the same performance hit at running the game at 4K, so yeah, the setting is really demanding, and you'd probably just be better off just running the game at 4K anyway at this point. Now FXAA stands for fast approximate anti-aliasing, and is a form of post-processing anti-aliasing rather than spatial anti-aliasing, as we just talked about. As such, it looks at the complete frame, then looks at the edges, and finally samples around them to make the edges look less jagged. Next, we've got TXAA, which stands for Temporal Anti-Aliasing, which combines MSAA with a filter. It uses the previous frame data to create a color sample in the current frame. This results in an image that doesn't look quite as sharp as some of the other methods, but reduces the shimmering light effect that you might see in some other games when you use different forms of anti-aliasing. I'll give you an example. If you turn on FXAA and Battlefield 1, you do still get a shimmering light effect around things like barbed wire. Next, we have SMAA, which stands for Subpixel Morphical Anti-Aliasing, and this aims to achieve the same type of quality and effect as SSAA and MSAA, with a lot less system impact. SMAA is often injected using something like Sweet Effects, so it may not be something that you can find in the menu directly. And lastly, the number after the AA tells you how many samples is being taken. You'll see this in the form of 
2x, 4x, ax, etc. And by taking more samples, the method of anti-aliasing will be more accurate and therefore look better, but a massive cost for FPS every time you bump it up. Again, what you choose is based on you, your desired frame rate target, like 60 FPS, the game and the graphics card and so on. There's no flower answer on what to set this to. Now with the different anti-aliasing techniques being difficult to understand and equally difficult to explain, we'll move on to texture quality. Now texture quality is in essence just a quality slider for how good the images are that are applied into the different 3D shapes and polygons in the game. High resolution textures require graphics card with a higher amount of VRAM as these textures are loaded and unloaded from video memory. That being said, bumping up texture quality will really enhance the way the graphics look, or the way the image looks. You'll end up with sharper, less blurry, and more detailed skins. As for its effect on performance, generally you'll see a greater disparity in FPS between ultra and low for lower end video cards, but so long as you have high enough VRAM, go for the best option that you can. Now in regards to texture filtering, interpolate samples to prevent textures from suddenly popping in when you get closer to them. There are of course different types of filtering, but for simplicity you've got isotropic, which refers to bilinear and trilinear, whereas antisotropic refers to its own form of filtering. Starting with antisotropic, it simply reduces the amount of blur and textures at longer in-game distances. You notice this more with things like buildings or angled surfaces far away. It's a newer and better implementation of isotropic filtering, which allows the texture quality at longer distances to be more similar to the textures closer to you. As for how it affects performance, it doesn't really. At least, the difference in FPS between the highest samples, x16, and the setting turned off is so minuscule, I would pretty much always recommend having it turned on. As for isotropic filtering, bilinear filtering samples the nearest tech cell and adjusts the color accordingly based on that. Now, trilinear filtering does the same, except instead of averaging the nearest tech cell, it smooths out the spaces. I'll be honest, isotropic filtering even confuses me. And as for what the numbers mean, the sample rates being 2x, 4x, 8x, and 16x for anti-isotropic filtering refer to the steepness of the angle that filtering will be applied to. So as far as I understand it, the difference between something like 2x and 4x is that 4x will filter twice as steep angles as 2x, but will also apply a regular 2x filtering. So for 16x, I'm pretty sure it just applies a regular 2x filtering, but with angles up to 8 times steeper than 2x filtering itself. If I were you, I would just ignore isotropic filtering completely and set anti-isotropic filtering to 16 there is rarely ever a conceivable drop in performance, and the image looks objectively better. And now we have tessellation. Trust me, this is a really easy one to understand. And if you look at the older games, and I'm talking way back, you'll notice that a lot of shapes are really simplistic. There aren't that many curved edges either, and this is mostly due to the model having a low polygon count. Everything that you see in games is comprised of triangles. If you bump up the number of triangles, you get a higher polygon count, which allows for finer details. Now, I'll give you an example of a circle. With a low polygon count, the edges are very jagged, but become much smoother as you increase the number of triangles that make up the image, thereby increasing tessellation. Increasing tessellation in games will add more polygons, depending on the distance, resulting in a much richer image. The engine does this by looking at displacement maps for the image and then calculating what it should look like. As a result, you get a lot more complex shapes. It does put a lot of strain on the GPU, so I would just try and test to see what the difference is, whether it's noticeable, and adjust accordingly to that. Ambient occlusion is a setting that handles lighting on objects. More specifically, it's how light radiates and bounces off non-reflective surfaces. As a result, the game looks more natural and overall, the lighting in scenes is improved. The overall image looks much more realistic as it calculates whether a specific shadow should be darker or lighter. It darkens creases and crevices that light shouldn't be hitting. And now there are a couple of different types to being HBAO, HBAO+, SSAO, and SSAO+. HBAO or HDAO stands for Horizon-Based Ambient Occlusion and is the better one of the two. It generates more samples around the shadow to determine whether that specific shadow needs to be lighter or darker. Now, HBAO Plus is a substantial improvement compared to HBAO and offers much greater realism. This is because whilst they both create the specialized shadows at full resolution, HBAO Plus has nine times the occlusion samples. The downside of this is that it's a lot more intensive than HBAO, 
but this is the best one to use. SSAO stands for Screen Space Ambient Occlusion and works by darkening the pixels that are blocked off from light sources. Compared to all the other different types of ambient occlusion, this one creates a shadow at half the resolution and uses 16 occlusion samples. Compared to HBO and HBO Pluses, 4 and then 36 samples. That said, it performs about on par with HBO in terms of performance here. Lastly, this SSAO Plus, and this is pretty much the same as SSAO, except from that its shadows are at full resolution rather than half. Unfortunately, it is the most resource intensive and doesn't look quite as good as HBO Plus, but it still produces decent results. As for FOV, FOV stands for Field of View and is quite possibly one of the best settings you will ever come across. This setting is related to the position of your in-game camera. Now FOV is measured in degrees and gives you greater peripheral vision. Imagine that every time you increase FOV, it also takes a step back in game. This value is preferential and should be changed based on what value feels natural or comfortable to you. If you're sitting further away, a low FOV isn't pretty but it's tolerable for some. If you're closer to the screen though, as I am, you might find that it makes you feel sick if the FOV is too low. Now I literally refuse to play games with a very low FOV, not because of some ego, because this tunnel vision is horrible and gives me motion sickness. It makes aiming feel unnatural as your camera doesn't properly depict what looking through the eyes of the character actually is and on top of that, it also messes with depth perception, at least in my experience. Have you ever seen games on console where the FOV is so low that when the character is running it just seems like he isn't getting anywhere? Well, that applies here too. A low FOV is unrealistic, limits what you can see in game and can cause motion sickness. Choose a field of view that feels natural and consistent among the many games that you play. As for how it affects performance, a higher FOV means that the GPU has more geometry and models to render, at least within the image that you're looking at, but generally won't affect performance nearly as much as you think. This setting is a blessing and should be one of the first, if not the first, that you change. Next is Bloom and it's an interesting one. It essentially tries to make lighting look more realistic and if you look towards the sun it's blinding and takes out a lot of detail as you can't really see what's going on, just like in reality if you look towards a really bright object. And whilst it is a pretty effect, I turn it off if it gets annoying, especially during competitive plays. As for motion blur, it's pretty straightforward. Now motion blur aims to imitate the movie and film effect. It does this by blurring movement relative to your environment and surroundings. If you move in an FPS game with motion blur enabled, chances are your arms and gun won't blur, but the scenery besides you will. That said, there's little reason to actually have this enabled, or at least fully enabled, as in some games you can alter the percentage of the blur, and it can look pretty nice, you know, 5%, 10% blur. Motion blur tries to fake a high frame rate to make it look a lot more appealing, similar to how you'd perceive it if you waved your hands in front of your eyes. It really can throw off your aim though. It rarely affects FPS significantly, but it's one of those settings I greatly encourage everyone to minimize the use of, or just disable it outright. Do that and you'll be fine. Next we'll talk about depth of field. If you take a look at the photography and nature settings, quite often what you'll see is a bokeh effect. And this is where part of the image that you're focusing on is in focus and the rest is out of focus or blurred. An example of this is in Titanfall 2. Now from a performance standpoint, depth of field barely affects performance and so setting it to what you want is preferred. It might look more visually appealing but also be a disadvantage if the game blows out useful information such as enemy players just because you're not focusing on them. Now, unlike ambient occlusion, shadow quality is literally how realistic and presentable the shadows look. It works largely by looking at sources of light and what they cast or don't cast depending on whether the model in front of them is transparent, like glass, or opaque, like leaves. Shadows will affect FPS quite significantly as there is a great increase in calculation that needs to be done. I generally wouldn't recommend having it off just because the game looks like pure crap without it and the entire world looks plastic, but setting it to something like low or something to maintain a solid FPS is definitely something to consider. Low shadows, as you can see on screen now, often look blob-like whereas high shadows are extremely well defined. Now lastly in terms of settings you have model quality. You won't get this option in many games but imagine it to be a lot like tessellation. This too increases the number of polygons making the model seem much more realistic rather than blocks, something which you can see in Doom. A higher setting will make the models look a lot more natural including what they do such as animations and an example would be reloading in a shooting game. This does of course increase the load on the GPU. Besides that, there really aren't many other options or settings. I mean, there are things like Nvidia Hairworks, 
That's literally just more realistic looking hair at the cost of halving your frame rate. There's also HDR. Can't be bothered to get into that, to be quite honest, because, well, fuck it. Now, hopefully going over 15 odd settings will give you an idea of what they do in game, as well as how they affect performance. A good idea would just be try them out and change whatever values you want and see if you prefer it. I mean, I can understand why many people feel overwhelmed, which is why the low, medium, high and ultra presets do exist, as well as the automatic tweaking things you find in GeForce Experience. If you don't end up tweaking, it's good to know what the settings are anyway, and how you can make the experience just that much better. If you did like this video, be sure to rate it, and also tell me down in the comments below what you thought, and whether you have any favourite settings, or if you don't understand something. There's many more resources on settings than this video alone, but I have tried to explain everything as easily as possible, and if you don't understand, just ask, no one will burn you for it. As I've said many times before, this community is really great. Anyway, thanks for watching, and until next week, adios! Back from the dead.